Well, good evening again, everyone. I want to thank Pastor E for, <clears throat> excuse me, for praying for us this evening. And um, I want to just go ahead and get started. How's your week been so far? I pray that it's been very good and productive and all of the above. All good things, all good things. Um, so let's get into this new series. Um, last week we had the beginning, the opening of it. And our series is called Building God's Way or Rebuilding God's Way. And we are essentially looking, studying the book of Nehemiah. Um, and this book is important because it gives us not only uh, historical context of the walls and the gates of Jerusalem, but it gives us a blueprint, um, at least one blueprint for rebuilding not just physical gates, but any uh, destruction in our lives. Um, areas of destruction in relationships, financial, physical, things like that. It gives us a blueprint of how we can get back on track. First of all, whether or not it is prudent to even rebuild. Yeah, to, to, to rebuild. But then if it is, how do we go about it? Okay. So let's take a look at this. Our uh, base scripture for this series is Nehemiah 4, excuse me, and 6. And please forgive me, I'm just a little uh, winded right now. But Nehemiah 4 and 6, and I'm reading from the Amplified Version, it says, So we built the wall. And all of it was joined together to half its height. For the people had a heart and a mind to work. The wall was built and put back together. Why? Because the people had a heart for the project and for the burden for uh, the project and a mind to actually work and get it accomplished. So let's take a look at Nehemiah. Go ahead and turn over to Nehemiah with me. And I want to give you some uh, facts about Nehemiah. The first thing, as I stated on last week, is that Nehemiah is what can be considered a complementary um, book with Ezra. Ezra uh, was also about the rebuilding, but Nehemiah <coughs> excuse me, dealt more with the, um, the physical and the political rebuilding of Jerusalem. The physical and the political rebuilding of Jerusalem. How many of you know that when something is broken, um, especially when it involves relationships, governments, communities, marriages, uh, that it's not just about the physical appearance, but there's also a structure, a, a, a system, a moral belief and or code that has to also be rebuilt. There's also a spiritual component to it. If we're going to do it God's way, the spirit of God has to be included, has to be involved in the rebuilding or building of whatever it is that he has tasked our hand to do. And so while uh, Ezra deals with more of the spiritual um, and the, uh, the, the, the spiritual concept of rebuilding, Nehemiah specifically deals with the physical, the actual uh, substance and, and tools and, and materials, physical and the political, uh, and thereby geographical restoration of uh, Jerusalem. And so the very coming out the gate, 
Um, let's turn over to Nehemiah 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, let's let's starting at verse one. It says the words or story of Nehemiah, son of Halkiah, now in the month of Shis, uh, Shisville, Shislev, excuse me, in the twentieth year of the Persian king, as I was in the castle of Shushan, Hananiah, one of my kinsmen, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them about the surviving Jews. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Surviving Jews who had escaped exile and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who escaped exile are in great trouble and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its fortified gates are destroyed by fire. When I heard this, this is Nehemiah, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and fasted and prayed constantly before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God who keeps covenant, loving kindness and mercy for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to listen to the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you day and night for the Israelites, your servants, confessing the sins of the Israelites, which we have sinned against you. Yes, I and my father's house have sinned. Let me stop right there. The first thing I want to bring out about the the beginning process, the prerequisite for building and or rebuilding is that there must be a burden. There must be a burden to build. That burden is not the same as wanting uh, popularity, wanting in this social media age, a lot of followers. It's not about uh, what some say securing the bag. You know, it is about a genuine concern. So to the point that seeing it in disrepair causes a heaviness, a burden on your heart. And as a people of God, when there is something that is such a burden that it should not drive us to uh, social media, it should not drive us to uh, to gossiping with our friends, it should not drive us to uh, creating a blog at at the at the onset, creating a blog about it, but it should drive us to our knees. The burden of building and or rebuilding God's way should drive us to seek the face of God. So whatever this burden is that you have, if it starts uh, or, or if it causes you to seek in any other direction first, uh huh, then you may have to consider why this thing affects you, why this thing causes you so much concern. You understand what I'm saying? So the first thing we see here is that Nehemiah was a praying man. Not only was he a man of 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 high means of of the uh, aristocratic uh, society, but he was still a praying man. Which means, I want to let somebody know, that you don't have to be poor to be godly. You don't have to be of low estate to be godly. So for all of those that, that, that 
you know, have something to say about acquiring or obtaining levels of position in government or uh, CEO or executive positions. God wants us in those spots, right? We don't have to just stay down and, you know, be at the bottom of the pool, God also has ordained and orchestrated that we also occupy levels of government, levels of business, levels of community activism. Why? Because when the burden comes, (coughs) excuse me, then our positions can already create platform for what it is he's going to do through our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Some people are so against people in the church holding, you know, it. shoot, if, if, if a pastor has anything more than $5 in his or her pocket, then, you know, they, they get accused of fleecing the sheep or, you know, just mismanaging the funds or something like that. Not taking into account that the same God that gives them word to bless your life, word to help you through situations, words of encouragement to start your business, why can't these same men and women also hear that word from God and be entrepreneurs and CEOs and and executives in their own businesses and in their own lives? Right? So it's not just... Uh, that that God would not have you to be uh, poor, right? The poor we will always have with us. But sometimes God elevates us so that we are in positions of power and influence in order to create the platform, have the ear of the people that we need to uh, have the ear of so that change and policy can be changed, right? It's not enough to protest the issues of our community. It's not enough to have sit-ins and 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 demonstrations and things like that if policy is never affected we can sit in we can march we can protest we can holler we can scream we can stay silent we can have blackout days we can make up catchy slogans but if policy is not changed if those who are making the laws don't have a change of heart, if those who are in positions of power do not become allies, nothing gets done. Uh huh. So I, I find it very um, encouraging that a man of means, a man of authority and power still had a burden from, for, for, for the place where he came from. He still had a burden for those who didn't have all that he had. See, Nehemiah, Nehemiah's job was the job of a cup bearer. And in case you didn't know what a cupbearer was, he was literally the, uh, the king or the pharaoh's uh, uh, taste tester to see if the food was good and or not poisonous, right? He was the first line of defense. There was no, um, there was no uh, granules to see if, if his food had been spiked, his wine had been spiked. There was no uh, paper, no thermometer to see if the temperature, <laughs> the temperature was right so he didn't get salmonella or nothing like that. No, Nehemiah was... The, the taste tester that was the cup he, that's who he was he was the cup bearer and so he would sip from the king's cup and if Nehemiah didn't kill over and die <laughs> then the king would go ahead and indulge and drink somebody needs to hear that because everybody is clamoring to be in charge, the number one, the number two in charge, 
but they forget that some of the most influential people never have a title, never have uh, the, 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 the fame and the notoriety that those with the titles get. If I were to say that Nehemiah was probably the second most important person in the kingdom, I would not be a far off. Because he not only had the heart of the king, he had his trust. I'm going to trust somebody who's, you know, like, like the Secret Service guards the, the, the president and those uh, 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 in political power, right? Nehemiah was the bullet dodger. If it was something wrong with what he was about to eat, Nehemiah got it first so that the king could live. And this put him in a very advantageous position so that not just his job was done, but that relationship was developed. And he had such a relationship with the king uh, that when he started looking sad, when he started looking a little bit off, the king may have been like, uh, uh, is there a problem, right? Because this man is, is taking bullets for you every day, right? Anybody dropping asp or venom up in your drink? <laughs> he, this is the man right here. And so Nehemiah visibly becomes disturbed so that this burden on his heart for the people and the city causes him to rush into the face of God. And he, 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 he gets to God through fasting and prayer and he makes his request known. Some people have the misconception that whatever we do, God has to lay it out for us. Right? He has to lay it out for us. Well, if God don't tell me that I'm supposed to clean up the neighborhood, then I'm not going to clean up the neighborhood because I only move at God's command. But if he put a burden on your heart and it distresses you to see the neighborhood in shambles, if it distresses you to see the young ladies and the young men just standing on the corner with no skills or nothing to do, wasting valuable time when they could be learning a trade or a skill or a language or how to knit or any other, uh, uh, any other marketable uh, skill. If he's put that burden on you, I know I'm talking to somebody, he's put that burden on you for the state of men, specifically uh, young men, then you don't have to wait till the sky opens, hello, and the voice of God comes speaking down to you and say, go forth and, and pursue this ministry. <laughs> If he put a burden on your heart, it should push you to the face of God. And there you say, God, I got an issue. I got an issue. And my issue is, I'm looking at all these young men. I'm looking at all these young ladies. I'm looking at the state of the educational system uh, in my ward, in my neighborhood. I'm looking at the fact that it's a food desert over here. I'm looking at the fact that uh, all these young ladies are coming up pregnant because they ain't got nothing to do. And I I'm looking at the state of you fill in the blank. God, and I understand the condition. I understand the why. But what I want to ask you is, can will you help me do something about it? Will you help me, since you've placed this burden on my heart, will you help me do something about it to shift the atmosphere? And that was Nehemiah. He sat down, verse 4, he wept, he cried about it, he probably said some choice words, 
right? That's in my imagination. He probably <laughs> he he probably contemplated on, you know, envisioned some things that needed to be done, but it says and he fasted and prayed. And then he said, "Lord, can we have a conversation?" What is it that God has been putting a burden on your heart? And every time you see it, it irks you. Every time you see it, it's like, oh, why is that still the same way? It could be it's the same way because God put a burden on your heart, but it has not caused you to move into actually being the blessing. Your church got a terrible choir and you can sing. Maybe that burden is on you to come and be a part of the choir. You don't like them old uh, uh, raggedy curtains, you know, in your church and you're a seamstress or a person of means. Maybe you need to be on a beautifying ministry. You hate the fact that the musicians are getting paid more than the pastor, but the pastor refuses to take a salary so that the church can be in financial solvency. And that burdens you because you see all that that pastor does. Maybe you need to be on the pastor's aid ministry. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You don't like to see the young ladies on the corner Maybe you need to start an after-school program. Maybe you need to start a knitting club, a book club. You're concerned about the food deserts in your community. Maybe you need to uh, take a, a day out of the month, however, whatever day they meet, and actually go to uh, the neighborhood commission meetings. Here in D.C., they're, they're the ANCs. The, the advisory neighborhood commissions. Maybe you don't like what's going on at your school. Maybe you need to be a part of the PTA or the PTO. But it's not enough to just have the burden for what's broken. The burden for what's been burned. The burden for what has been torn down and destroyed. That burden should push you to seek God and seek him in a way that says, I am willing to make a sacrifice of my own time, of my own efforts, of my own resources, of my own knowledge so that this situation can be better. So he prays. He prays and he understands the condition why, excuse me, why the the gates are in the condition that they are in. That's the second thing. You got to ask when 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 we're building or rebuilding God's way, we have to be willing to acknowledge what caused the breach in the first place. Why is it broken? Why was it burned? Why is it destroyed? Why is it failing? Why is it um, not working the way that it should work? And a lot of times we can't fix the problems because we don't want to really acknowledge the root cause. I'm being very simplistic here, but you, you asking the dentist why you got five cavities, but you don't brush your teeth every day. That would seem like an obvious, but some people, they think their breath smell like roses and sunshine. And they never seen a tube of toothpaste in their life. They think that they can just swish with water and go on about their day. No. Some of y'all need some peroxide, if y'all ain't got no list of ring, go get you a little bit of, because <laughs> I know y'all probably got some, some Christian brothers up in your house. Get you a little bit of Christian brothers, switch that thing around, kill some of them jars up. <laughs> go 
get a toothbrush, go get some floss, you know, go shoot, go get some of that dental gum or something, right? You got to acknowledge what the root issue is, right? You trying to figure out, you know, just recently, um, as of last week, my son, my youngest son, you know, we, we, we started seeing water in our home. Came through a little hole in his in through his ceiling. And we like we wasn't sitting there like, oh, the Lord is showers of blessings. No. We like, look, we got to figure out where this water coming in from. Right? So Pastor E and and, and the youngest uh duckling uh, got up into the attic, crawled around, stirred up a whole bunch of dust, made some spiders and some silverfish mad, right? <laughs> but they ultimately were was able to see what the problem was. And they saw that there was water cascading down into the wall. Now, they could have said, oh, okay, we see the water, and that's what's causing it to come to the ceiling. But they were smart enough to say, the water didn't just get here on its own. It still has to be another way, another reason, excuse me, why it's coming in. And so they did a little bit more investigation and found out that one of the shingles on the roof, we ain't going to get into why the shingle was sliding, okay? If y'all want, if you want the TLB version, y'all contact me personally. I'll tell you who not to get as a contractor. But <laughs> the shingle had slid down, and all of the rain that we've been getting, the water penetrated that one spot where the shingle had come loose, and it happened to trickle down and and apparently had been doing so for a minute to the point that it now caused a weakness in the drywall in the ceiling. It didn't just happen overnight. Apparently it had been happening for some time for it to come through. Now we could have just said, oh, well, let's patch up this right here on the ceiling and, you know, everything will be okay. Or we could have, which we did, one of the things we did, could have just put a mat up, you know, something to catch the water and be like, okay, well, that's that's good enough. No. We said, here's the problem. This is going to be an issue. It's going to get worse if we don't do something about it. So immediately, in order to remedy the situation, we had to go to the root of the cause. I thank God for the people that came out and 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 took care of that. And they was like, well, how long has it been going on? Like like two days or something. And they was like, oh, that's it? And it's like, uh, yeah. It's like, well, normally most people just wait until it's a real issue. No, not us. But what's going on in your life that's been broken, that's been out of service, out of commission, Right? That you have not taken the time first to seek God about it and then to get to the root cause. We can't build or rebuild if we won't deal with the root of why it's broken, why there isn't, why there's lack. And Nehemiah spoke with God and he said, I understand. The issue is because we jacked up jokers. Courtesy of Pastor John K. Jenkins. Senior. We are jacked up jokers and we have sinned. We did it. I acknowledge it. We is wrong. (laughs) I know that ain't good English, but it's good sense. We is wrong, Jesus. Verse 7, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, statutes, and ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. We did it. We, we, it's us. 
However, we acknowledge what the issue is, but God, you said this is how we this is this is how we should be structuring our prayers, right? The Lord's prayer is our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You got to get that. I'm sorry, but I'm going to do better in there. And then you can say, lead us not. See, you want them to lead you, but you don't want to acknowledge what's wrong. He said, we joke because we, we jacked up. We tow up from the flow up. We did it. We admit it. We sorry. But your word said, if we confess our sins, Jesus, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Nehemiah turned that thing around. He was like, but Jesus, remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If your transgress and are unfaithful, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you return to me, yeah, that is, if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts were in the farthest part of the heavens, the expanses of outer space, yet will I gather them from there and will bring them to the place in which I have chosen to set my name. So we got to figure out why it's, is there a burden? Why is there a breach? And if there is a resolve, if there is a remedy for it, we see in these very scriptures that he had the burden he acknowledged the root, but there is a remedy. Sometimes when something gets broken, there is no restoration, and sometimes there's no repair. Taking the example of glass, if anyone has ever dropped or shattered a glass, it depends on exactly what the item is. If it's a vase, then it may be able to be repaired. If it's a drinking glass, it may be able to be repaired. But how it breaks or how it is broken will determine whether or not it can be restored. If it is broken in shreds, in strips, in shards, or in shatter, if it's in shreds, shreds can be mended back together, right? You take a, a, a needle and some thread and you can mend it back together. Today we got the, the elastic glue. You can mend it back together. If it's in strips, it can be mended back together. It can be pasted together. Right? And some of the, the, the restoration work makes it even more beautiful. That's where we get quilt work and uh, some of the bohemian skirts that I used to love when I was younger. It, they were made out of leftover strips of fabric. Beautiful works. They can be repaired. But when something shatters, depending on how it shatters... It may be able to be put back together, but it may never be able to be used in the same way. That doesn't mean that it still can't be used. But if it's completely demolished, sometimes we have to say, it's better to leave a thing broken than to try and fix it 
and do more damage. That glass that has been shattered, if it's in big pieces, you may be able to glue it, super glue it back together. But once you start seeing those tiny little shards and you, we miss a lot of it, right? We, we've broken glass in the house and, and we thought we've gotten it all up. We've vacuumed, you know, our first thing is to sweep, get it up. And then we take the vacuum to get what we can't see. And even then, there have been times where a week later, we find shards that we miss that shot way over, you know, across the floor. Sometimes it's more dangerous to try and put back together something that has been so utterly destroyed that you just have to let a thing be. But you have to at least consider if there's a remedy, if there is the ability to be restored. Somebody has treated you bad One of the instances I I always say is domestic violence. A lot of our young ladies, and and please don't, don't, don't think that I'm victim blaming, but a lot of our young ladies stay in the brokenness because they feel like there are no other options. They feel like if I leave, then I lose everything. And so I keep trying to, to, to fix these shards, this brokenness. And, and because of the, 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 the multiple shards and, and sharpness of it, I just keep hurting myself. At some point, you got to scoop that up and toss it away. You can forgive them from afar, but you have to determine with God's help whether or not it's worth restoration or whether it's time to just for it to be rubbish. And so here we see that God had already given the remedy. He said, because you are jacked up, because you disobedient, because you hard headed, I'm going to scatter the inhabitants. I'm going to scatter your, uh, your, your legacies, your, your, your children and your children's show. I'm going to scatter y'all. But here's the restoration. If you return to me, if you get your act together, if you stop doing that thing which it, it keeps keeps you broken your lungs are in bad condition but you keep smoking your liver is toe up from the flow up but you keep drinking you're in bankruptcy and everybody knocking on your door because you owe them money but you won't cut up your credit cards says, if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, have a discipline about it, make a commitment to say, I will no longer continue in this way. Though you were broken, though you were in debt, though you were sick, (laughs) I will restore you. I will bring you back to a place of wholeness and healing. And then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it, not just so that you're going to get the benefit of it, but I'm going to do it so that I can put my name on it. So that others will see your life, your situation, your shame. And see how I restored you. See how I blessed you. See how I brought you back. And give me the glory. And so this was Nehemiah's prayer. He said, God, 
if I can get your ear and your attention, I need you to hold up your end of the bargain if we hold up ours. And I want to be a part of making that come to pass. So what is it that you need to do in order to bring about restoration? You got to first, what I say, you got to admit that you messed up. You got to admit it, right? And maybe, maybe per se, you didn't necessarily mess up, but you were in the company of someone who messed up and it had a ripple effect. But you got to, you got to figure it out. And if you're honest and you go to God, God will, I don't know about you, but he always show me my mess. I'll be sitting there and I'll be like, man, why I feel so down, so depressed, so, you know, I just feel out of sorts today, God, spiritually. He like, yeah, you you, you remember yesterday when you uh, said all your Sunday school words while you was going to pick up your son? Yeah, and, and, and then the word of God came and convicted you, you know, like in Ephesians 4, where it says, let no corrupt communication come forth out <laughs> That that's why you feel like crap today. Cause your spirit is grieved. Cause you said some stuff you ain't supposed to be saying. God, why, 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 why my husband sleeping on the couch? Maybe because uh, <laughs> you you called him a couple of those Sunday school word names. Or why my wife won't won't respond to me in a loving manner? Maybe because you ain't treating her right. She been after you for ten weeks to fix the fix the faucet in the bathroom, and you didn't fix your golf clubs. You didn't fix your bike. You didn't fix yourself lunch. You didn't <laughs> everything but that faucet, right? You got to do that. Why is it necessary? Why is it necessary? You have to figure it out, not just so that you can identify it and then find a remedy, but you have to figure it out. Uh, you have to figure out a way to get to a place of restoration because one, the gates and the walls were a form of shelter. It it was a form of stability for them it was a form of security for them and ultimately for their success if these walls and these gates were not repaired it kept them in a vulnerable vulnerable position to be attacked by anybody and everybody so something seemingly so small, so insignificant, so, you know, trivial could mean so much. It would affect their shelter, their stability, their security, and their success. It would affect their shelter, their stability, their security, their success. Let me say it one more time because I don't see nobody writing. It would affect their shelter their stability, their security, and their success. And why is that important? Because those are four of the main needs that we need in life. It's not just about having a roof over your head, but it's about having a safe place. A safe place to be able to express yourself. A safe place to to be able to let your hair down. A safe place to be able to, to, to vent to someone, not just anybody, but someone of wise counsel. 
so that you can gather information and gain wisdom in return. We all need a safe place. A safe place for our heads, a safe place for our children, a safe place for the expressing of our ideas. We all need shelter. We need a safe place from when the enemy tries to attack, we can run and hide. We need shelter. And we know God to be a shelter. Psalms uh, 90 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That place represented shelter. But it also represented stability. We all need stability in our lives. I don't care how spontaneous, how uh, wild and free-willed you are. All of us need some sort of stability. While we may not um, uh, acknowledge that we, we like stability or that we need some type of structure, we do. We need stability in our lives. We need to know that on the 1st and the 15th that that check is coming in. We need to know, right, that uh, whatever the case may be, we, 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 we need to know that there's stability. We need to know uh, that that number 36 is going to run every two minutes. Or, or, or every uh, five minutes so that we can get where we need to go. We need to know that our grocery stores are going to have the products that we need so that we can live our lives. We all need some form of stability. And the walls and the gates represented that. And some of your, your lives are in such disarray is that is because your walls and your gates are down and you have no stability. But with stability comes accountability. Somebody has to be held accountable for doing their job. So stability, security, not just a place to run to, but a place where we can feel safe. When I was a young girl and I was I grew up in a single parent home, uh, as as much mouth and, and, and girth as I had, when I got scared, I still ran <laughs> and jumped in my mother's bed. Cause that represented security. The storms could still be going, it could still be lightning, the lights could be flickering, the lights could be out, it don't matter. Once I was in that bed next to my mama, I was good because she represented security. I knew that if anything broke out, that my mama was going to be able to handle it. If somebody broke in the house, my mom was going to come get up with, with the karate chop or the kung fu. <laughs> right? I was going to help her too. I was going to be her wingman. You wasn't just going to roll up on us and ain't nothing going to happen. Right? All the, all of the south side of Chicago was going to come out. But my mother represented security for me. Even when I tried to smell myself as I was getting a little older, uh, she represented security. I would go back to her when I was having one of them days and just needed to talk. Because I knew that the wisdom that she would give would bring about not just correction, but it would help me see what I needed to see. She she was security for me. Husbands, you you can give your wives flowers and candies and 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 cars and diamonds and all of that. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't give them a sense of stability and security, your marriage is going to be jacked up. We need to know that you coming home when you say you coming home. We need to know that the the money that needs to pay for the rent and the 
for for the lights and the gas is not being gambled away uh at what's that place out in baltimore harris what's i don't know mgm that's national harbor but wherever we need to know that we have that you are able to provide for us stability and security, even if you lose your job, because we know that you're going to provide stability. We know that even if you lose your job, you're going to get up and, and do a side hustle because you're going to provide for your family. Children need to know stability and security. And one of the things that tore me up when we were going through this construction process is that we were kind of nomadic in where we had to live. And it burdened me because it was like, okay, are we going to be at the hotel? Are we going to be at this place? Where are we going to be? And so we were as as soon as possible trying to put down even if it was temporary roots so that we weren't like jumping around every week or every two weeks right we stayed at at our temporary place for almost one place like almost nine months right we look we got to get them through school so we're gonna set roots down right here so that they have some sort of stability We all need this. We all need it. Why? Because having those three things will ultimately lead to our success or our demise. If you don't have stability, it's not that you can't learn it, but it makes your your growing process a little bit harder because you don't know what that looks like. And so you tend to mimic uh, the, the point said children live what they learn. So if you lived in a house that was always in chaos, chaos became your normal. And you became comfortable with dysfunction. You became comfortable with Uh, always being on edge. You became comfortable with living by the hair of your chinny chin chin. And while that may have molded you and, and given you a drive to get out, a lot of times, a lot of times, it contributes to your failure. It's important mothers, fathers, that you give your children that sense of stability every morning. Don't start it if you can't complete it. Give them a sense of stability in prayer, in reading the word, in in quoting those, those, those Bible verses before they get to touch that biscuit. They will appreciate it. It will cause them to have success in their lives. They may hate it now, but give them the foundation that they need in doing chores around the house. It will help them succeed in life. Give them the, the, the discipline that you going to go to school. And once you get out of high school, even if you don't go to college, you're going to get out of here and do something. You're going to go find you a part-time job. You're going to go cut some grass. Give them a sense of responsibility and it will contribute to their success. So this is what happened. This is what happened. And Nehemiah prayed and sought God. And he says... If it be your will, help me to do something about it. I'm going to end right there tonight because I know that somebody, I pray that this is making somebody think. I know we want the lessons and the sermons that make us shout, but we got to, once we finish shouting, we still got to walk straight. We still got to be able to conjugate a verb and put a sentence together. After we didn't shout it all over high heaven, we still need to know how to uh, manage our finances. 
we still need to know how uh, to to de-escalate uh, an, a, a situation if faced with uh, a, a police stop. We still need to know uh, proper hygiene techniques. Our young men still need to know how to tie a tie. So after all of that, we still got to think and we still have to do. And this is the challenge to you tonight and to me. Get up off your duff. God has placed that burden on your heart for a reason. He's put you in the position he's put you in. He's giving you the job you have. He's giving you the ability to flex your time. He's giving you the ability to, to, to have connections. He's giving you the resources that you need for such a time as this. Stop waiting on somebody else to do it. Stop waiting on uh, the megaphone of, of heaven divine. To give you Amelia Bedelia instructions. Somebody going to get that. The burden is there. You seek God. And you say this is what I want to do. And God will give you. If this is his will. You present that before God. And God's yes. Will come with resources. God's yes will come with systems. God's yes will come with strategies. God's yes will come with vision. And where there's vision, there's provision. But you got to get on up. Get up now. (laughs) So what you going to do? I want to build a great cathedral for the Lord. It's a burden to see this happening. What you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? You ain't got to tell me. I don't need to know. I ain't in all your business like that. But this is the call. This is the wake up call. God show me, send me a sign. Hello. This is your wake up call. Get to it. I'm going to stop. Building, rebuilding God's way. I pray that something I said tonight blessed you. I pray even more that it challenged you. And because I am who I am, I don't even care if it made you mad. <laughs> I hope it made, I hope it stirred you so that I'm going to show her that it, it, you get up off your duff and go do something. That's my prayer. And God answers my prayers. Amen. Are there any questions for this evening? Any questions? Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Who all did I miss? Minister Prince, good evening. Reverend Leftwich, good evening. Mother Winfrey, good evening. Sister Penn, good evening. Jelani, good evening. Who else I miss? Elder Winfrey, good evening. Good evening to everybody that I, I didn't see. Good evening. Hello. All right. Oh. Hello. All right. If there are no questions, um, if you think of something, always, you can still contact us by going to our website at www.thebridgebelieverscenter.org and click on that link that says connect. Put your question in there. Tell me who you are and a way for us to get back to you 
to answer your question or you can send it to us by gmail at the bridge believer center center spell c-e-n-t-r-e at gmail.com or you can call us we actually have a phone number with live people we haven't gotten to the point where we have all of the automated systems yet it's coming but <laughs> for right now we we actually have live people on the phone right so if you got a question, you can call us at 202-583-TBBC. That's 202-583-8222. Okay? God bless you. I love each and every one of you. I appreciate you so much. And we're going to be back here next week getting into it. I'm going to get into it some more. Because there's a lot that God wants to accomplish and some of us are slowing down the building process because we keep trying to do it our way. But we're going to get it right. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us, Minister Prince. All right. Should God say the same? We'll be right back here next Wednesday. Walking through the word in our new series, Building slash Rebuilding God's Way. Go ahead and do some homework. Go ahead and read for me the next uh, three chapters. So go ahead and read chapter two, chapter three, and chapter four so that we'll be on target for next week. All right? Love you all. Have a good evening. Good night.